The corona pandemic has so far cost half a million lives worldwide. Especially hard hit are countries with high population densities and the poor are also disproportionately affected in better off industrial countries. Germany and other European nations are spending billions to try and revive their struggling economies. We ask, poverty on the rise, is the COVID cure worse than the virus? Welcome to To The Point, I'm Peter Craven, and my guests are Rahida Banam, who is a freelance journalist from Lebanon, who believes that the coronavirus is hitting the poorest areas the hardest and giving some governments an excuse to restrict political freedoms. Also with us is Deutsche Welle's own Chiponda Chimbelu. He's an editor with DW Business here in Berlin, and he says the EU's huge rescue package could derail European efforts to reset their partnership with Africa. And a warm welcome too to Andrew Gilmore, Executive Director of the Berlin-based Conflict Pre Pre Prevention Organization, the, the Berghoff Foundation. He argues that disease and conflict feed off each other, so it is vital that countries in the West, however cash-strapped they might be, don't cut back on development aid and peace assistance. Thank you all three for being here today. Uh, I'd like to begin with Chiponda. Chiponda, this is clearly a global crisis, and we tend to say that it impacts everybody, but it, it doesn't impact everybody in the same way. What's your take on that? Well, clearly it doesn't. I mean, if we look at um, people in African countries, the way they are impacted is very different from people in European countries. Here in Germany, there is the Kurzarbeit program, for instance, for those who um, have been furloughed and they can receive some money from the state. And that's not the case in most African countries where most people just have nowhere to turn. And these are people who generally live on the basis of a daily income. So when that is cut away um, by lockdown restrictions, that also goes away. So they are very, very desperate. So the situations um, in terms of how people have been impacted mm. are clearly extremely different depending on where you live. There are those nevertheless who say that this is an opportunity for huma humanity to rise like a phoenix from the ashes, you know, in the crisis. Do you think that's in any way likely? I would like to be an optimist, but from what I've seen so far, I'd like to say not yet. Um, I think a lot of the focus in Europe has been on trying to get the situation within the European Union sorted out. And if we look at the United States, which is also struggling, it is quite clearly the case. So the focus has been um, on fixing things within borders rather than on looking at the problem as um, extending you know, beyond other places. And of course, we are all connected by COVID, but obviously the solutions that are being created at this point are not um, interregional and intercontinental. Rahida Banam, let's talk about some of the facts here. We've already mentioned that the death toll has passed 500,000 people and that uh, for the first time in two decades, global poverty is on the rise. Is the situation quite simply out of control? It is out of control, actually, in, in many countries, especially in the poorest countries. I mean, uh, especially in Yemen. Uh, Yemen, they're not even testing. They don't have even the equipment to test how many people are infected. I mean, the official numbers coming out from there is 1,200 infection and around 350 deaths. But uh, there was estimates by the London Institute for Health and Tropical Disease saying that there's over a million Yemeni infected already, and they're expecting that number to double every three to four days. I mean, in places like Yemen, it's a disaster. I don't know what the world can do to help them. What, what about your own home country, Lebanon? Tell uh, us about that. In Lebanon, it's also a disaster. Uh, I mean, the British ambassador a few days ago described the situation in Lebanon as it's in a deep hole and it's getting deeper and nobody knows how it's getting out. Of course, it started uh, with uh, protests asking for reforms, but then the coronavirus came and people started to lose their jobs because companies had to close for, for a long time, restaurants and all of this. Um, and so when... Uh, um, the lockdown ended, they were hit by another economic crisis in Lebanon where the currency lost 80% of its value within a few weeks. So whoever had a few savings before they lost their jobs, now their savings are gone, they're not worth anything. Uh, so it, coronavirus with the economic situation in Lebanon has made things much, much worse. Mm -hmm. People are saying that it's, good, that it's a bigger crisis for the country than the 15-year civil war that ended in 1990. 
Yeah. Exactly. I mean, I remember in the civil war, in this, even in the civil war, uh, I lived through it. I mean, I remember the end of it. Uh, we were able to go to school still. Uh, we never felt hungry. Now people are talking about not being able to afford meat anymore. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, even the army issued a statement saying we're not offering meat in our meals to the army, to the soldiers, because we can't afford it anymore. Schools are closing, private schools, of course, because public schools in Lebanon are not, are not good. Nobody goes to them. Private schools are closing because nobody can afford to pay the tuition. So kids are left without schools, first because of corona, and now because schools are closing. So. OK. Andrew, you're based here in Germany. Uh, just give us a quick word on your take on how the German government is, uh, is tackling the crisis. Well, I think we can very safely say that compared to the two countries that I know best, which are the United States and my own country, Britain, Germany is handling it remarkably well. But, but even not comparing it to that very low bar, I, I would say Germany has handled it well and it, and it is recognised around the world as having done so. What about these huge sums of money that are being spent? Is it enough? Is it too much? Is it not enough? I would say it is probably enough in terms of handling the case in Germany, but it's definitely not enough for handling it beyond that. OK. We'll talk about that in just a second. As we've seen, massive sums are being uh, mobilised to prop up the German and the European economies. Uh, let's have a quick look at that story and then we'll talk about it. Chancellor Angela Merkel and French President Emmanuel Macron want to save the European Union from recession. At their initiative, the EU is making 750 billion euros available, especially to member states in southern Europe. We shall continue to work together in the coming months to ensure that Europe makes it through this crisis, which will continue to affect us for a very long time to come. Germany is also spending a lot in response to the pandemic. To protect its industries, which are central to the economy, it's providing more than 500 billion euros. And in the United States, the government and the Federal Reserve have so far made $2.5 trillion available to support the economy. But what about poorer countries? How are they faring? Let's just begin with Germany and Europe, first of all, this huge amount of spending that we've just heard about. Does it amount to something that is going to have the kind of impact like an, a new Marshall Plan here in Europe? Potentially for Europe it could, and that is something um, that has been touched on. But um, obviously it depends on whether the EU does agree to it. They are going to have the negotiations on the 17th and, uh, of July. Um, but apart from that, we've also had a lot of criticism of the plan. It just doesn't go far enough to helping developing countries, for instance. Any Marshall Plan um, in the world today should do that. And the German development minister, Gerd Müller, made, um, well, was speaking to media yesterday, and he spoke about how that just is too little for uh, developing countries. Um, we're talking about the European Union extending or its overall budget for development by one billion every year. And that doesn't really go far enough. He's calling for a stabilization program of 50 billion euros. So there's a huge gap. Mm. You know. uh, Rahida, a lot of people say, you know, it's become a commonplace to say we're all in this together, but we're not really, are we? Oh, no, definitely we're not. I mean, take a look at the United States, for example. Uh, there were statistics that uh, people from the African-American community, people in Bronx, for example, in New York, are dying at a much, much higher rate than they should, mm -hmm. much more than the, the white Americans. I'm sorry for the language, but this is the truth. And, I mean, take a look at Germany. We, we don't want to go too far. Where is the, Where are the, the most concentration of infections at the moment? They are in the meat industry, where workers work in, in really bad conditions, workers who come from uh, Romania and Bulgaria, they all live in very cramped flats, eight, nine people living in one room. Uh, and there was a video coming out from one of the meat factories showing people uh, eating in a cafeteria together, sitting very close to each other without any respect to uh, social distancing, to, you know, there's... Uh, the poorer communities, unfortunately, now are being hit the hardest, uh, even in developed countries, even in countries who are fighting this epidemic the best, which is Germany, um, but yeah, we, we see now refugee homes, we see now workers, laborers, I mean, they are the worst hit at the moment. Mm. Andrew, you're listening very attentively, but it must be with some trepidation that you, you, you hear this about poverty being, the poor people being the victims of the, of the, of the crisis that we're facing. Uh, tell us a little bit about the, how poverty translates into conflict, because that's your, 
real area of expertise. Well, poverty and com conflict are absolutely linked and more poverty in leads to more greater conflict and conflict leads to greater poverty. So it's a, it's a cycle, but we've now seen a third element of this is that COVID leads to is feeding COVID and conflict are both feeding off each other. And, and this is a really worrying aspect. I and mean, this is something that, that we at the Berghoff Foundation are trying very hard in areas where we are most engaged, such as in Yemen that I had mentioned, and Afghanistan is to try to get people to put aside their differences and to not and to try to resolve them in nonviolent means. Mm -hmm. uh, to tell us about the, the, how important in that equation you've just been describing the, the, the aspects of justice and equality are. Because we're living in a time where, you know, all the, all the figures are telling us that, you, that there's more and more injustice and there's less and less equality, that the, the rich and poor are growing apart. Right. No, that's, that's a key point. And as you may know, um, Germany just yesterday took over the presidency of the EU, but also the UN Security Council. And, and I know, because I've been with the UN for actually 30 years, the Germany on the Security Council has played an absolutely key role in recognising this point about justice and equality. Because at the base of every single internal conflict around the world, which the Security Council are dealing with, human rights is, uh, is at the core. There's some form of exclusion, injustice, marginalisation that lies at the root of every single conflict. And this is what we are very much hoping that Germany will use its presidency of the Council to, to push that agenda. Is that likely to happen, Chibanda? Well, I'm not so sure. I mean, uh, European Union, the European Union countries are uh, totally disagreeing about how this rescue package should go forward. I mean, there's the frugal four to speak of, Denmark, the Netherlands, uh, Sweden, and, um, you know, they don't obviously want um, the pack, and Austria, of course, they don't want the package to go for. Uh, go on as it is. They want more loans for uh, it, countries like Italy and Spain, which mm. would be benefiting more from that rescue package. And so obviously, if there is no agreement in the European Union about how this should go forward, I can only imagine what they're going to do when it comes to talking about other countries outside the EU. And this is exactly where I think um, the EU is going to lose out because uh, countries like China have been very effective in, you know, assisting African countries at this point. And of course, they've had their own issues issues with COVID, but it's not been quite the same way. I think this inner focus uh, within Europe, which is also a very political thing, because of course, in a sense that they're trying to prevent the rise of populist parties within Europe. So it's a hard balance within Europe. And for that reason, there's a lot of distraction. And that is also taking away from um, the focus that they could put into helping developing countries deal with the problem. Mm -hmm. Okay. In nearly all the countries that it has affected, the coronavirus has uh, affected the poor more than the rest of society. Two examples now, one from Germany that we've already mentioned and one from Bangladesh. The Turniers company is one of the biggest meat processors in Europe and scene of the largest cluster of COVID-19 cases in Germany. Many of its workers are brought in from southeastern Europe. They live and work at very close quarters. The virus spread like wildfire. 1,500 have fallen sick. The situation in Bangladesh is not all that different. Its garment factories are also hotbeds of infection. Many workers have caught the disease in the crowded and poorly ventilated premises. Are poor people more at risk of coming down with COVID-19 than the well-off? Yeah, we're going to go to Bonn now. We're joined by our colleague Zubair Ahmed from DW's Bengali service. He's going to tell us a little bit about the situation in Bangladesh and especially about the situation in the garment industry. And Zubair, you have described that in the, te in the, uh, the, the items you've been writing about, about this story. You have described the situation as economy down, poverty up. Tell us more. Uh, well, actually, in a nutshell, what I have written in that article that you are referring to is that for the last two and a half decades, Bangladesh's economy has grown. Especially in the last decade, the country was really doing good. As economy went up and uh, the poverty went down. But during this pandemic, things went upside down. For example, before COVID, one in every five people in Bangladesh was poor. And one in every 10 people was extremely poor. But during COVID, economists speculate that the number has doubled. So if you consider the total population of 170 million people, 40% of it is a huge number, almost the total population of Germany. And who is worst affected by the pandem pandemic? Is it, is it uh, 
the poor largely or is it the middle classes as well or is it the society as a whole? Well, of course, the whole economy has been affected. The main two pillars of the economy, export income and inflow of foreign remittances have dropped drastically. But if you talk about people, those who are in the bottom of the pyramid are the worst hit. While it certainly includes the poor, it also includes a part of the middle class who were solely dependent on their monthly incomes, and they are mostly from the informal sector. Like recently we were doing reports about people leaving the capital Dhaka and heading back to their villages because they are not being able to afford the living cost anymore there. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's, there's clearly urgent need for reform, further reform of the garment sector, but with the uh with the, the cash flow problems uh, that are going to result from people, for companies in the West not paying as much as they have been or investing as much as they have been, that reform is going to be a very tough process. Well, yes, definitely. If you compare with the previous year, the total export earning reduced around 84%. And out of this export, around 80% comes from this ready-made garment sector. And 4.1 million workers are dependent on this industry. Because of this pandemic, uh, Europe and US, the two biggest markets for Bangladesh, are also suffering. So we saw huge order cuts. As the industry is solely export-oriented due to these order cuts, so far more than 1,000 factories are already closed down. Those which are reopened after this lockdown are running at limited capacity. Hundreds of thousands of workers are also losing their jobs. And tell us about how important uh, the, the issue of remittances is, which is a huge source of income for Bangladesh. Well, uh, last year, if you see that Bangladeshi expats in total wired almost $18 billion to the country. So, uh, but recently we have seen that the inflow of foreign remittances is also declined. In March, they dropped by 12%, we have seen, and in April by 25%. So, uh, and also estimates suggest that over 1.4 million migrant Bangladeshi workers out of the 10 million who live in different countries of the world have either returned or are on their way back home due to job losses. So impact there as well. One last question uh, I'd just, just like to put to you is, are we actually seeing now in Bangladesh people going hungry? Is starvation a problem in the country? Because the UN feed pro food program has been warning that that, is a, that that is a growing concern? Well, it depends on many factors. Bangladesh grows a decent amount of food, though according to WFP, there are few millions are suffering from food insecurity. Uh, and also the problem is transportation. What we have seen recently, like during the lockdown period, farmers were unable to transport their harvest. So they faced a steep loss. That's why, as the experts say, that the government has to provide them with enough stimuli so that they grow food and the country don't have to deeply depend on imports. That's how they can avoid this famine, what we are talking about. But of course, it also depends on how long this pandemic lasts. OK, Sabir Ahmed, thank you very, very much for joining us there from the uh, former German capital, Bonn. And uh, I'd like to come back to you, Rahid. A very interesting impressions there from uh, about working conditions in Bangladesh. We mentioned working conditions here in Germany, and much praise, I think it's fair to say, has been heaped on people working in frontline professions like transport, people who work supermarket tills, nursing, education, and what have you. Uh, a lot of people are saying that these the, these jobs, people who work in these jobs, should be rewarded more generously, paid better when the dust has settled on the crisis. Is that likely to happen? I mean, in this economical crisis, uh, w even with this massive package that was agreed on, and they well not agreed on yet, but in the EU that they're studying now, uh, there will there will still be economic consequences in, in all the countries, uh, and I doubt that they will start talking now about proper pay rises. But they should because uh, I mean, at least in Britain, I know that the NHS workers are not being paid very well. Uh, in Germany as well, I know the nurses don't get paid very well as as good as they should be, and this is one of the reasons there is shortage in, in nurses. Uh, in Germany. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, those jobs, those people who uh, people discover that they are important in the community only in, in pandemic times, I mean, they should be, of course, looked after uh, better.
in mm. normal times. The UK mentioned there, Andrew, that it was interesting last or in the recent days, there's been a lockdown in the British Midlands city of Leicester where people have been commenting on high levels of poverty, high levels of inequality as contributing to the situation in the city. How can that be in a country that is uh, among the top ten in the world in terms of uh, wealth? It is, I would have thought it's almost a logical impossibility, but unfortunately the UK has achieved it, that uh, of, of having the, the highest number of deaths in, in, in Europe and the worst in economy. It, it is staggering to many of us that this could have happened. Is, uh, are we? Do we need here a de when you talk about the, the 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 mechanisms that you're talking about here? Do we need a debate about globalization and about the problems that globalization uh, has caused? That how it leaves pe poor people, the the people at the bottom of society, exposed to forces out outside their control. Well, we absolutely need a debate, but it, it is not the fault of globalization that we've got into this mess, that we've got into this mess partly as a result of the anti-globalists, the populists, blaming globalization for doing so. The sums that are being spent on, in, in this country and elsewhere in Europe are massive, and rightly so. What is being spent on trying to r reduce the problems outside this rich area are tiny by comparison, and this is... I fear very short-sighted because all our indicators are that next year there's going to be a big increase of violent instability and conflict. This will lead to more poverty, more extremism and more migration. So I really do feel that actually it is in the, is it would be in the enlightened self-interest of Germany and the rest of Europe to actually dramatically increase the number of money, the amount of money that is spent in these places. It seems difficult to even imagine doing so at a time where, where we feel so cash-strapped because of the money that we're having to do to spend to keep our own economies going. But I do feel that in the long run, it, is, it will be very much in the interest to, to increase. And I'm sure Germany's uh, development minister would, dis would definitely agree with what Andrews just said there, because obviously he pointed that out yesterday when he was speaking with the German press, um, that the gap, you know, uh, around 49 billion dollars, uh, billion euros rather less, and, um, you know, what the EU is planning to do for at least developing countries is just not enough there. And he warned of, you know, um, crisis uh, in terms of, you know, more people migrating from other parts of yeah, the world. I'm just trying to get to um, the bottom of the crisis, even Time magazine, for for example, a very much an establishment publication, if you so will, uh, in the US context, it has been saying the time for global change, the time almost for radical change is now. Yeah. Is it going to happen? Is it going to happen? I would like to be the optimist who says yes, but I, I just don't see enough signs. And the, you know, the EU rescue package is one example. And I mean, what's happening in the United States is another. Uh, I mean, I'm American myself. I mean, grew up in Africa, so I totally understand I live here. So I, I can just sort of see how things are working. And in none of those areas, uh, in terms of the uh, political will, I don't see the political will to change things and the political will to really work together and come up with global solutions. Yeah, I just wanted to pick up on this and talk a little bit about how some countries are using this for the political agendas. I mean, we saw in Lebanon how uh, the government used the, the, the coronavirus uh, to uh, stop the protest because there were people protesting every day on the streets, demanding, uh, you know, anti-corruption laws and uh, so on. And also in Egypt, some people are being arrested because they are demanding better uh, governance for the for the epidemic uh, and, and, you know, using the corona law. Uh, in Hungary, not very far from here, there was a low passed by the government, by the by the parliament. I mean, now it's been repealed, by, uh, but it gave the government or it gave uh, the prime minister, Orban, uh, power to rule by decree. And uh, some opposition now and NGOs are saying, even if the government, the, the parliament has repealed this uh, law, but the government still has a lot more power than it used to, to have before. Uh, and in Russia, of course, where it's mm -hmm. okay to go and vote on constitutional reforms that might keep Putin in power till 2036, but it's not okay to protest against those reforms because because it's corona and it might, you know, spread infections. So it's, it's really being used by some politicians to advance their own agendas. Mm. It's been a very troubling discussion we've had, uh, Andrew. Is there light at the end of the tunnel? People need hope. There is light for Europe. I, I think we can safely say that, that for Europe, the, the measures that are being taken provide an element of light. For, the, for much of the world, though, I would say we're nowhere near a state of, of light in the tunnel, and that is why we need to act now to help them. Chipondo, same question. Yeah, there's not enough light at the end of the tunnel for um, the rest of the world. I mean, Europe looks like it's on a good path, but um, I wouldn't say that's the case for Asia or Africa, um, especially the poorer countries, obviously. Mm.
we have to be optimistic or, or <laughs> we won't be able to fight anymore. Uh, there's always hope, there's always optimism. Uh, it's just people need to push the agenda they want on their leaders. So. Okay, we've been uh, discussing the link between the coronavirus and poverty. I hope we've given you plenty of food for thought. Thanks very much to all three of my guests for coming along today. Uh, one last word, Chiponda, yeah? Um, just a conclusion or? Yeah. Um, well, we I... began with you, we began the show with you and I'm intrigued to see how you will, uh, you know, bring it to, a, draw it to a conclusion. Well, I'm us. just, I just want to see how the EU rescue package unfolds because I think that will help us um, figure out what happens for the rest of the world, at least from the point of view of Brussels. Yeah. Okay, thanks very much indeed. Bye-bye. Tschüss. -bye. <laughs>